we're here <laughs> finally <laughs> sorry for the delay sorry. <laughs> yeah sorry for the delay yeah all right luke philology and the incarnation is it is that the one we're reading yep and i put the link in the description if anybody's interested um if they want to follow along and also i'm going to drop a link in the chat uh so that people can join us because i love that yeah i wouldn't mind that yeah it'd be great yeah. luke doesn't want to hang out with just me <laughs> <laughs> i just I... He's like save me <laughs> Save me from this crazy person. <laughs> oh. That's so bad. Okay, I'm I, know. That joke. I know. I know. I know. It's like I've got... I have to live with myself too. <laughs> Jalapenos. Yeah. Jalapenos. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm, I'll tell you about I'll tell you about that later, but <clears throat> No more helping you. No more helping you for me. <laughs> oh my goodness! I, I mean, there, I never, I never could handle hot, hot, hot. I, no I you know, when I was when I was in India, I loved it. I ate everything hot, and I never got any special consideration. And um, it was an adjustment, but after a while, you actually like you're addicted to it. Yeah. No, that's yeah. true. I, yeah. I, I feel like I started with like no palate for it and then started Sorry. enjoying jalapenos. And then after the jalapenos, it came habaneros. And then I started growing like a bunch of really, really hot chilies. And <laughs> then I started making hot sauce. And then I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh. And now I've got stuff that like it makes it makes grown men weep. Like, well, they, have they, you they, heard? They have it. you heard? Have you heard Merlin Sheldrake talk about fungus and how they actually make you do things to proliferate themselves? Mm -hmm. I wonder if peppers have anything in common. <laughs> oh, I think it's healthy for me. I think capsaicin, oh. if you look up like the benefits of capsaicin, uh, it's, it's, they're significant. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, they've been eating them in India forever. Yeah. I think I know, it's. I, I used to, uh, there were some Indian men that I knew in India and they'd go to the street vendors and they used to dip these like hot chilies in like a, a chickpea flour and deep fry it. And, and then you could buy those, right? Like they're, yeah. they're on the streets in India. Oh man. And, I would, I would love and these one. guys, and I, I don't know what kind of peppers they eat in India, but like you can't even be in the kitchen when they throw them in the frying pan. It, mm -hmm. Like Molly would be like, okay, the peppers are going in everybody out, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and um and then you know this guy would eat eat one bite into it you know chew it up swallow it and then drink a hot tea and then he just burst into sweat and go ah <laughs> just, <laughs> just it's, it. there's something cathartic about it it's like you, you know, must be, you know? i yeah. think you have to yeah it's one of those little victories you go through you go through this torture for a time and then yeah you come out the other side and it's and it's almost like a near death experience you know <laughs> with, a, with a hot pepper i'm i'm talking carolina reaper and hotter so it's like yeah you get into some of these strange little what do they use for breeds. bear spray do you know what do they use for bear spray bear spray what do they use oh inside i think that is maybe I that know. is pure capsaicin okay i don't know my son got it in the face once. He was he was on a city bus in Vancouver coming home from school. And oh my God, I have to laugh because, because I know him so well. But he's sitting on this bus and this guy's running like top speed down the street. He, you know, he just like a like a like a lightning bolt comes past the bus and he jumps on the bus and the bus closes the doors and starts to drive. And this guy who was chasing him, sprayed pepper spray right in the window of the bus, which was open. Wow. Into my son's face. How old was he? 18. Wow. And, um, and he was just like, 
He couldn't breathe. He couldn't see. And he said, all I did was clutch my laptop because I didn't want anyone to steal it. <laughs> that would that would be insane. He probably had to get a new computer after that. I would have crushed it. Well, he, he yeah, they, the bus driver called an ambulance and he was, you know, he was sitting in the ambulance for quite a while, eh, getting that stuff cleaned up. Goodness. It was brutal. Yeah, I've heard that, that, that. Yeah, I heard it can blind people, you know. I suppose yeah. it's not supposed to, but yeah, that's amazing. I'm going to eat another one. <laughs> what? <laughs> The, the peppers are calling you <laughs> yeah i brought the jar down here like, like i gotta you. i gotta make room i've got a lot of pepper plants going out i decided to go down from like 16 different pepper varieties to just like five and that's it and grow in large quantities my favorite peppers rather what happens peppers. if one of your kids happens to go out in the garden one day and just pick one and eat one like you know that happened to me when sunny was like my son he was um probably like eight months old and he got a hold of a a ghost pepper scorpion cross <laughs> and it was so this so crazy cool. looking pepper that had a stinger coming out of it oh my god and they're really really hot and so he had one in his hand because he, he would just often go out to the garden and pluck cucumelons off and stuff like yeah. that and pop them into his mouth and he loves those but you know the next step is picking a pepper or putting anything in the garden in his mouth and it's like yeah. it's, you can't and i mean it. even if he doesn't eat it but gets it on his hands and then rubs it in his eyes and oh i know you're not a very you're an irresponsible parent <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> you have those peppers with, with like guard those things good lord I tell him, Thou shalt not eat of this tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't always work. When he does, he'll be driven out into the forest blinded. <laughs> yeah. Whether that symbolically or, you know. Really? <laughs> okay. Enough okay. of the chit chat. Let's yeah. get down. We can, we can try reading this. I think I'm going to struggle gonna... to read. I'll read it. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, Owen Barfield, um, Philology and the Incarnation. Sir Thomas Brown, that mystical or quasi-mystical author of the 17th century, wrote a book which he called Religio Medici, The Religion of a Doctor, a Medical Man. Many, many years later, in my own youth, in fact, Professor Gilbert Murray, who is well known in England and is probably known over here as a Greek scholar and humanist, wrote a little book, or it may have been no more than a single lecture reprinted, called Religio Grammatici, the religion of a scholar or man of letters. It occurred to me after I had given the title of this lecture that if I had been a little more pretentious or a little more brash, perhaps I might have ventured to call it religio-philology, which I suppose would mean the religion of a student of language, perhaps especially a student of the historical aspect of language. You know, this is one of the things I'm starting to understand more about Barfield is that he's not just a student of language, but he is a student of history, the history Hmm. of language and and um and those are i you know like is that what philology means <laughs> <laughs> because i don't know i don't know is either that, i okay. yeah. i don't well, actually know what philology is. <laughs> <laughs> all okay. i know is it's not what's the other one in in the humanities in uh well there's ling linguistics, linguistics yeah which is not the same which he said that in humanities departments, Owen Barfield did that uh, linguistics. Um, it ousted philology. Yeah, it ousted philology. Yeah. The original study of language in academia was philology and then right. shifted into um, linguistics, into which, linguistics, which makes yeah. perfect McGilchrist sense. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because Let's he's. Let's use McGilchrist as an adjective. <laughs> 
the shift in the analytic thinking as well. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, the dissection of language, right? Like, yeah. let's 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 get the microscope out. Mm -hmm. Let's reciprocally narrow. All right. It is impossible to give much attention to words and their meanings, and more especially the history of words and the history of the changes which those meanings have undergone without making a number of interesting discoveries. Moreover, in my experience, the discoveries one then makes are of a kind which it is impossible to make without being forced by them to reflect rather intensively on the whole nature of man and of the world in which he lives. Um, I just want to make a... Um, reiterate to those who are watching that there is a link for this essay in the description if you guys want to follow along. Uh, we're on the one, two, th third paragraph. Let me give you a very simple example. Has it ever occurred to you, I wonder, that the epithet charming, as people use the word today, has certain very odd features about it? In the first place, it is the present participle of a verb active, namely the verb to charm. Grammatically, therefore, when we speak of an object, a garden, for instance, or a landscape, or perhaps a person as charming, we make that object or person the subject of a verb, which denotes an activity of some sort. That is why we do, that is what we do grammatically, but it is not at all, or it is only very rarely what we mean semantically. When we speak, for instance, of a child as charming, we do not mean that the child himself is actually doing something. On the contrary, as soon as we notice that anyone, a child or a woman, is charming us in the verbal sense, in which case we rarely use the simple verb by itself, but we find some other expression as putting on charm or exerting charm, so as to bring out the notion of a willed activity. When that happens, the charmer who is charming in the verbal sense generally ceases to be charming in the adjectival sense. Mm -hmm. Well, you could say the same thing about the word enchanting. I mention these two words because they're good examples of a whole class, quite a noticeable group of words in our language which possess the same peculiarity. One has only to think of such words as depressing, interesting, amusing, entertaining, entrancing, fascinating, and so on, to realize that we tend to allude to qualitative manifestations in the world outside ourselves by describing the effect they have on us, rather than by attempting to denote the qualities themself, themselves. The next thing that you find about this little group of words, if you go into the matter historically, is that these words, when used with these meanings, are all comparatively recent arrivals. This I found really fascinating. <laughs> Most of them first came into use in the 18th century. None of them is earlier than the 17th, I think. The kind of question one is led to ask is, is this just an accident, or has it any wider significance? That is just the kind of question which the philologist the student of language, in its historical aspect, is led on to ask himself, is the appearance of these words at this comparatively late stage just something that happened to happen? Or is it a surface manifestation of deeper currents of some sort? So you have a linguistic habit, one must say, arising in the West in the course of the last few centuries of describing or defining or denoting the outer world in terms, as it were, of the inner world of human feeling. Well, let's pause there. you have any thoughts? Um, just interior knowledge versus exterior Excellent. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like in, in what, what we once did, uh, was use the outside world to describe our experience in what could be referred to as pre-modern times. And at some point, there was a, a radical shift that took place, and we began describing 
our experience of reality using words that are like they're almost like meta words you know <laughs> yeah he gets into that further in should we just keep reading because there's some really interesting i mean i learned a few things here about words for sure yeah, yeah. let's keep on going okay maybe i'm maybe i'm reading too far ahead and i'm forgetting what what i read well i know yeah it's easy to forget what you read when you read barfield <laughs> All right. Now let us take a look at another group of words, a very much larger group at this time, indeed an almost unlimited one. I'm referring to all those words which go to make up, and this is, um, for those watching, this is not an English literature or, you know, grammar class. <laughs> Just, mm -hmm. it gets, it, it, this is important to uh, working up to the, to the, the, uh, the idea in the essay. Um, okay, I'm referring to all those words which go to make up what the 19th century utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham called the immaterial language. In other words, I mean all those innumerable words in any modern language which do not refer to anything in the outside world at all, but only to the inner world of human feeling, of human thought, only to states of mind or mental events. And then he has these examples hope. Fear, enthusiasm, conscious, embarrass, humility, ambition, concept. You can go on reeling them off, any number of them, of course. If you take the trouble to look up the etymologies of these words, you will find that in every case, either they or their predecessors in older languages, from which they have taken them, we have taken them, at one time referred not only to states of mind or mental events, but also to something or some event in the outer world. That is, of course, what one might call elementary etymology. Only this time, it is not usually a matter of looking back just a few hundred years into the past. We have to take a much longer survey if we wish to observe the historical process to which I am now seeking to draw your attention. First, let me make this point. Everyone is agreed, and I repeat, everyone that there was such a historical process. Now you may ask, how do I establish that rather bold proposition? And the answer is, I establish it because I am in the position to call two witnesses to it from the very end, opposite ends of the earth. In saying, quote, the opposite ends of the earth, unquote, I'm not only alluding to the fact that one of them is American and the other is English, though that happens to be the case, but I am thinking much rather of the fact that they represent diametrically opposite philosophies. Um, diametrically opposite points of view and beliefs about the whole nature of man and his relation to the divine disposition in the world. And for those of you that are, hi, Neil. Hi, everybody. Um, Dolly and Racco and Ron and... Um, just uh, so you know, Neil, there's a link in the description of what we're reading from. And there's also a link in the chat if you want to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just let me know if it's, if it's still there for you. Um, okay. The two witnesses. Oh, no, wait. Let me finish that sentence. But I am thinking much rather of the fact that they represent diametrically opposite philosophies, diametrically opposite points of view, and beliefs about the whole nature of man and his relation to the divine disposition in the world. The two witnesses I'm thinking of are the transcendentalist Emerson and the positive, positivist philosopher to whom I've already referred, Jeremy Bentham. You'll find in the section on language in the longer version of Emerson's two essays, which are entitled Nature, the following passage, quote, every word used to express a moral or intellectual fact, if traced to its root, is found to be borrowed from material appearance. Right means straight. Wrong means twisted. Spirit primarily means wind. Transgression the crossing of a line, supercilious, the raising of the eyebrows. We say heart to express emotion, 
the head to denote thought, and thought and emotion are words borrowed from sensible things and now appropriated to spiritual nature. Most of the process by which this transformation is made hidden from us in the remote time when language was formed. Well, that is Emerson. This is something that George MacDonald talks quite a bit about. And out of curiosity, I wanted to know if he knew Emerson or read Emerson. And now I honestly can't remember what I found. I know, I wanna, I wanna look really quick because I think they might've been contemporaries. Um, I think I, I think I remember a, we studied the transcendentalists in like ninth grade or something. Yeah. And they told us about Emerson and who else is a famous transcendentalist? There's Thoreau. 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 So I just remember like that. <laughs> Okay, so he was born, he died in 1882, and MacDonald, and I think I read, um, let me just see here. Sorry, guys, for the pause, but I really want to know this again. Okay, MacDonald died in 1905, and as far as I remember, they did come to know one another. I don't know how, how well, but I think they, they met. And, and like this, this idea here that uh, Emerson writes is very much uh, in the imagination essay by George MacDonald, which was written, let's just check it. This is my need to, uh, to put myself in the shoes of George MacDonald, <laughs> 1867. Okay, 1867. <laughs> It'd be interesting <clears throat> to go back and see when he actually met Emerson. All right. Um, man, uh, there's some things in this previous passage. I So I wrote incarnation in big, bold letters in the side because it was the first, the first time where I felt like... Uh, Barfield was alluding to what I'm anticipating in this essay is an appearance of, um, he says every word used in used to express a, a moral or intellectual fact, if traced to its root is found to be borrowed from material appearance. Mm -hmm. and I was thinking about, okay, that to me is incarnation. Like, uh, the breath of life um, breathed into dust. And so, I don't know, uh, the word being exhausted itself uh, creates this material, uh, this material, I don't know. So- Well, I, you know how I say it? It's I the word, it. word made flesh. Yeah. Right? And it's reciprocal. Like you, you derive your language from the natural world. And, I, and this is something I, I, that became really um, obvious to me when reading the imagination essay with George, when he says the human being is the world turned inside out, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, no, the world is the human being. I always get it mixed up. The world is the human being turned inside out. Yeah. And it's from there that we, you know, like he says, you know, you're looking around for a way to express yourself to your friend and suddenly there stands your thought before you. God put God thought it before you did. And he's talking about things in nature, plants and trees mm -hmm. and animals and wind and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then you 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 take that phenomenon, like that thing that's actually happening, and you and you yeah. you turn it into a way to express what's happening inside of you. Yes. Right? And so I have to think before I say things like this sometimes because I, my husband has to laugh at me because I, I, I get stuff. But for me, that is like the word is flesh. Like, so let's say it's a tree, yeah. right? It's flesh. It's, it's actually a living thing out mm -hmm. there and it's a word. Mm 
Mm -hmm. But then I take it and I put, and bring it into my own self, right? And into my, like, like I read that Douglas Harding thing, like into my center, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, it becomes my flesh, mm -hmm. right? So it seems to me, and if anybody's listening and does, you know, doesn't see that the way I think I see it, please correct me. Because like I said, my husband, anyway, I won't even tell you half the stories. It's too embarrassing. But um, he often laughs. He goes, Sherry, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> but it seems reciprocal. Like, yeah. Well, what do you think is the difference also between like incarnation and incantation and how that relates to language? You talked about, isn't this the same idea that you talked about once uh, in one of those other things we read about manifesting and positive thinking and that kind of thing? Is that what you're thinking of now? Or no, now? not necessarily. I'm not even thinking of it in a magical sense. I'm thinking of just... Uh, spoken language like incantation i i'm i'm trying to take it out of that its use in a magical sense and put it back in its more spiritual sense of uh, uh yeah so but it is i mean according to tomberg and this is this is where i want to get really radical right and steal these things back yeah okay it is it is sacred magic yeah so that's what I'm, yeah. So if, <laughs> if I'm allowed to use that language, I give you all permission. Any, any kind of uh, <laughs> do it differentiation there, because I think it's, it's hard for me to, to always it, like these, the power is there and the power can be used for good or it can be used for like, you're going to flap your mouth no matter what. Right. And, and, you know, we all know the tongue can light forest fires, but yeah, but then you're back to the, <laughs> I mean, if 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 I if I want to be so what's the word? If I want to be so bold, you know, then you're back to the Chinese farmer story like is 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 that thing you said bad? Evil? Mm. Maybe. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you plant your garden and, you, and your garden is growing and then a hailstorm comes along and just decimates it. We would call that bad. Yeah. But is it bad, right? Is the storm evil? Yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm i just throwing it out there. No, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh. Okay, but. Well, we'll just keep going. The, that last line that he says, we say the heart to express emotion, the head to denote thought. And thought and emotion are words borrowed from sensible things mm -hmm. and now appropriated to spiritual nature. Right. Like that is, I don't even know if I can fully swallow what he's saying there, but. Well, I mean, we just, we don't, like when did trans when did crossing of a line become the word transgression like when did that actually happen right mm -hmm. when did the raising of the eyebrows become the word supercilious right it's but he's in that process too it became immaterial you know it, it in that in that process of abstracting it from the material world we bring it from the material world into the immaterial world and and then we create a language around an immaterial reality. Well, you know, I, this is why I love, um, I love German because, uh, and there, a lot of people make, you know, do comedy about this because German is just such a rudimentary language and they can make a compound words like there's no tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> and so like the, uh, there was a there was a German uh, comedian, and he used to dress up like a prehistoric guy, and he'd say things like. He 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 talked about language, like the German language, right? And um, I just remember the one example he used was Feuerzeug, like so a lighter, you know, that you use for lighting, making, 
lighting a cigarette or a cigar or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the word in modern German is Feuerzeug, and Feuerzeug means fire thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you could just imagine like these, all these, you know, Neanderthals, like little apes, you know, sitting around and give me the fire thing, fire thing, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I think that's what Emerson's talking about. He's talking oh, about yeah. like we're, we're just lost to that the origins of these things, right? Because they're so far back in time. Because they're most of them are onomatopoeias, you know, or or so a lot of them are, stones, yeah, you know, yeah, so. yeah, 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 totally. I think I don't know. However, language em uh, emerged, if language does emerge, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> I don't know. It's just interesting that. Well, I won't go down that road. We should probably keep reading. <laughs> we will never get through that. Essay. Okay, so that, that's 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 the um, that's that's a little bit of information there from Emerson, and now he's going to talk about Jeremy Bentham. So he's you have to remember remember that he's he's comparing these two guys, one American, one English. He's calling them um, two people from the opposite ends of the earth because he says that they represent diametrically opposite philosophies, diametrically opposite points of view, and beliefs about the whole nature of man and his relation to the divine disposition in the world. Okay? So now we have Emerson's point of view. Now we're going to get Bentham's point of view. Then you find Jeremy Bentham, hard-headed positivist, Jeremy Bentham, in an essay of his entitled Language. It comes in section four of the essay, writing as follows, quote, Throughout the whole field of language, parallel to the line of what may be termed the material language and expressed by the same words, runs a line of what may be termed the immaterial language. Not that to every word that has a material import, there belongs also an immaterial one, but that to every word that has an immaterial import, there belongs, or at least did belong, a material one, unquote. So he's saying the same thing as Emerson, right? I'll just, let's just, uh, every word that has a material import, there belongs also an immaterial one. And to every word that has an immaterial import, there belongs a material one. When therefore we approach this immaterial language, these words which refer to the inner world only, we know that we have to do with words that at one time were words of the material language. We know that there has been a transition from the material language into an immaterial one. Can we go still further and at least in some cases observe the transition taking place? The answer is that in some cases we can. You see, if in the case of any word of the immaterial language, we can lay our finger on a period in its history when the older material meaning had not yet evaporated, if I may put it that way, while the later immaterial meaning had already appeared, then we shall have located the transition itself. So he's looking for that moment of transition when the word goes from crossing the line or, you know, the language goes from the, the phrase crossing the line to transgression. <coughs> now let me take one of the examples Emerson himself gives where he writes, Quote, spirit primarily, primarily means wind, unquote. I imagine that is as good an example as any you could choose of an immaterial meaning, which was originally a material one. In this instance, we have the best possible evidence that there was a particular time when the material meaning and the immaterial meaning still operated side by side in the same word. Yes. Not only so, but we know that that time was the time about the beginning of our era in which the New Testament was being written because in the third chapter of John's gospel, you read in the account of our Lord's encounter with Nicodemus, first the words, quote, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, unquote. And then in the next verse, quote, the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, unquote. And then again, Quote, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit, unquote. But in the Greek, it is the same word, pneuma, 
that is used, whether it is wind or spirit that is being referred to. In rendering the two phrases which occur in one and the same verse, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and everyone that is born of the capital S spirit, the translator has to use two different words for what in the original text is one and the same word. The two meanings, the material and the immaterial, were present side by side or mingled in the one Greek word. Now, I want to suggest that if we set side by side the two linguistic phenomena which we have been looking at, we see on the one side the thing I spoke of first, the relatively recent tendency to refer to the qualities in the outside world, call it the world of nature if you like, in terms of their effect upon ourselves. Then you see on the other side a much older habit. I call it a habit because this time is too widespread to refer to it as a mere tendency. That much older universal habit of referring to ourselves and our thoughts and affections in terms of the world of nature, the outside world. So we see reflected in language a curiously equivocal relation between this outside world and the inner man, the self or ego of the human being which experiences it. But we see something more than that. If you survey that equivocal relation, as I've called it, historically, you can't fail to be struck by the fact that there has occurred in the course of ages a change of emphasis. One could really say a change in the center of gravity, a change of direction, in the way in which this equivocal relation operates. Looking back into the past, we observe an external and outer language, a material language referring to the outer world of nature, which becomes more and more used in such a way that it becomes an inner language or an immaterial language, as Bentham called it. And this is clearly a very important process, for it is only to the extent that we have a language in which to express a thing that we can really be said to be properly conscious of the thing at all. That may sound a controversial proposition, but I think it's an experience which we all have as children. When our learning to speak on the one hand, and on the other our whole awareness of our environment as a coherent and articulated world, increase side by side as correl correlatives to one another. What then was the thing of which this gradual historical development of an inner or immaterial language out of an outer or material language enabled mankind as a whole to become aware? The answer is clear, I think. I like how he adds that in. The answer is clear, I think. <laughs> it was none other than the existence, hitherto unsuspected, of an inner world in contradistinction to the outer one. In other words, it was the existence of a man's self as a conscious individual being. Clearly, it was with the help of language. It was through the instrumentality of language that individual men first began discovering themselves. Yeah, and it's al he's almost describing the formation of the ego itself. In yeah. human consciousness. Self-consciousness, yeah. Yeah. Self-awareness. Yeah. Is that different than the ego? Like how is how is self-awareness different from well I haven't, you know, I've been I've been thinking about the ego because you know the ego it's like it's like it's kind of like Christianese for the old man. You yeah, gotta, gotta crucify that damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every that's... single day and you know so I'm, I'm like let's be a little let's go easy on the ego <laughs> you know because we actually need the ego right it's just that the ego the ego is powerful right it's powerful and um and I think the question that the ego is asking most of the time like you know is the one we're asking is who am I who, who am I? Right. Yeah. I think, so, yeah, go ahead. No, I think he's actually making like the historic case for like when the ego 
you know, kind of emerged. And and I don't think he's qualifying it as a good or bad thing. He's almost saying how unavoidable it was as the in the evolution. Well, I mean, we see it like honestly, we see it in a child, right? So you have a baby. Yeah. There's no ego there. It is differentiation. It's uh, and then and then suddenly the kid starts to develop, and and suddenly they 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 have preferences, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I don't want that. I want to do that myself. I don't love you. I don't whatever. Right. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm even thinking that the, you know, when does the child begin referring to them, to them, their own self, you know, they're, they're not even aware of that until no. a certain point in their cognitive development or their, the point of differentiation where they speak, you know, maybe it happens early enough when a mother's holding her baby but like the baby doesn't realize it's apart from, from the mother, you know? And yeah, Desmond, Desmond says that the child, that the infant doesn't know where its body ends and its mother's begins. Yeah, exactly. And then that's not in the womb, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a real process of like actually indiv individuate individuation, I guess, you know, um, and I want to avoid that in a in a psychological way because sure. I think it's an actual physical individual individuation, right? Sure. As well, it's and a little, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the ego, like the ego, has to. It's like a diamond in the rough to me. You know, it just it, it just needs to have all its rough edges uh, polished off, and you know, we know what that feels like, right? When our ego. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We really literally like that's we feel that. Oh, we man. Yeah. That is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, where did so... I leave off now? Well, you're. But now what do we imply? Yes, that's okay. exactly where you're at. But now what do we imply when we say that something has been discovered? If it was discovered at a certain point or during a certain period of time, as it must have been, we imply that there was a previous period during which it was not yet discovered. But please note carefully that although this must always be the case, it may have been the case for either of two reasons. The thing may have been undiscovered because although it was already in existence, although it was always there, no one had so far happened to notice it. That's the one reason. Should I be in order, I wonder, here, in placing the discovery of America as an example of that category? I don't know. But anyhow, there are plenty of other examples. Take the planet Neptune, for example. That's the first kind of discovery, not discovered because it didn't happen to be noticed, although it was already there. But the thing might also have been undiscovered for a different reason. The reason might be simply that it wasn't yet there. If you discover a new wildflower in your garden next spring, let's say, it's an annual. The reason you didn't discover it last spring may be that the bird or the wind, which carries the seed, didn't happen to have passed that way, whereas this year it did. That is the second kind of discovery. We cannot always be certain which of the two causes of any particular discovery belongs to. It is conceivable, for instance, that even the planet Neptune might not have been in existence until about the time it was discovered. Though I expect we are right in classifying that as a discovery of the first kind. But there is one case where we can be absolutely certain that the discovery was not of the first kind and therefore was of the second kind. And in brackets he has the discovery of something which did not exist until it was discovered. And that is the discovery by man of his own existence as a self-conscious being. The reason is plain enough. It simply does not make sense to say that at one time, self-consciousness was an existing fact which had not yet been discovered. You can be unaware of many things, but you cannot be unaware of being aware. In this case, therefore, the discovery and the birth of the thing discovered are one in the same event. 
I want to reread that because I put that in brackets. I, 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 I really liked it, obviously. You can be unaware of many things, but you cannot be unaware of being aware. Hmm. In this case, therefore, the discovery and the birth of the thing discovered are one and the same event. We see then, looking back into the past, a condition of affairs in which it was not yet possible to speak of an inner world or an individual self in contradistinction to the outer world. And when, did the, and when this did begin to become possible, the inner world at first could only be suggested by the way in which one employed the language of the outer world. We see this particular way of using words, the, if you like, symbolical way or the way of imagery, gradually growing in strength and variety until there comes into being a whole rich immaterial language, a rich treasury of words, which had at one time indeed an external reference, but from which in common usage, all the external reference had long since passed away. That is what we see when we look back into the past. And then we see looking at the present, a state of affairs in which the tables have been turned. Tables have been turned in the linguistic relation between man and nature or between the individual self and its environment. Because as I pointed out at the beginning, if a man now wants to say anything about his natural environment, anything rich or qualitative, as distinct from the purely quantitative measurements of natural science, he has to do it by employing a language whose literal reference is to something that is going on within himself but employing it in such a way that he somehow suggests that those qualities exist not in himself, but in the world outside himself. I have, it is true, given only a single indication of this last, namely a particular small group of words. There are, in fact, plenty of other indications of what I'm saying, but it would take too long to go into them. I'm not, and I should like to make this very clear, attempting to argue a case. I can go no further than stating it. Now, a change of direction is by, should you want to, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Cause I'm just reading away here. No, I, I have, I have a ton, but I'm also like, or I feel tired. And I, yeah. and I, and I know that I'm going to sound super speculative if I bring up something that I'm thinking of, because it's like, he's generating a lot of different. Um, yeah. And he goes, he, he, you know, he's, he's, he, he was a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> so he's building a case and sometimes you, you um, have to, well, not sometimes, almost all the time you have to be very, very patient because you think he's going in one direction. Then he, whoop, you know, veers off into another. Did it, does it, did this start to make you sad? Because it started making me sad. Like when I, <laughs> I'm reading through this with all my preconceived, you know, understandings of where I think Barfield's going to go with this essay. And, you know, I'm reading something that kind of speaks of this, this movement into one's in this immaterial language as, as like a very negative thing because we've lost some kind of connection to like, it's, it, you know, this, this self-referential, this like, uh, what does he say here? Um, he has to, okay. Uh, if man now wants to say anything about his natural environment, anything rich or qualitative, as distinct from purely quantitative measurements of natural science, he has to do so by employing a language whose literal reference is to something that is going on within himself, you know? And so it's like mm -hmm. this, this way in which he, he's now trapped within this world of like using the material the immaterial language because it's so rooted in in this it's really that like tomberg describes the world of the serpent mm -hmm. right like it's really like um well for one thing it's it's um horizontal right because it, it only it does it does it's not it only exists on the on the one mm -hmm. physical plane, right? And um, 
And then it's just kind of like the Ouroboros just eating its yeah. own tail, right? Like I guess I'm thinking of like a world in like 3D and now you're bringing it back into something like a, you know, like a 2D world because, because you're disconnected. But he does finish the sentence saying, uh, but those qualities, well, what does he say here? I'm not going to read it. It's, I thought he was trying to save himself at the end there, but Barfield, it, Barfield twists around sometimes. And, and I feel like by the end, well, of the see, end yeah, like regarding your feelings of sadness, I think that they're warranted because, because you perceive an earlier world of full participation in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like a child, like, like a full yeah. participation. And, and now he's describing this, this withdrawal away from the uh, nature, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and so but this is, this is the pattern that he follows. Like, this is always what Barfield will be talking about. He'll always be talking about in these terms. And the, the one thing that I had to come to terms with, because I, I struggled with the same thing. I'm like, oh no, don't go over there. It's like watching a horror movie. Don't open the door, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. And, and, um, but Barfield says, you know, this is, this is actually part of a healthy process. Okay. And, and, um, and so it has to happen. And the best way for me to relate to the whole thing is to think of a child growing up. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have full participation in the world where the, when the child doesn't, know where its body ends and its mother's begins, okay? The child and the mother are one. And this is outside of the womb, not in the womb, okay? And then the, and then the child starts to withdraw, right? Which is, I mean, you certainly wouldn't want your child not to do that. Like mm -hmm. that's as mm -hmm. a, you know, a good parent wants their kid to be able to fly, right? Find their own mate, make their own nest, live their own life, you know? Yeah. And and um and so that that's the process that that Barfield sees us in on a cosmic scale. Right? Where so he always talks about original participation, withdrawal and final participation. And he always says the only way to get anywhere is to go through. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I know it's like that, that's the, the realization is like, all we have are, are, are these, like, we have to communicate, you know, <laughs> with, with each other. And what we're yeah, and I, to is like these, I, these finite words to, to, to do it. Uh, these are these words that are, they, they can only point to something beyond just like our experience can only, you know, I don't know. I get well, in trouble articulating what I'm trying to get at. But. No, I, I, I totally understand because that was always the frustration I had with Barfield. I'm like, is he telling me this is a bad thing? Because he doesn't seem upset enough about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's my opinion. He be madder about this. You know, I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. I know. And I, and I, man, he leads me right into those little traps he's got. Like, I know, I know. And I, yeah. And it's, and I think that's also what makes it hard to um, understand him because you're, you're literally um, distracted by your own feelings while you're reading it. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm just speaking from my own experience. Okay, Luke, like I'm, I'm speaking from the way it felt when I first read Barfield and I'm just like, you know, first I'm like, yeah, that's right. We've forgotten nature. And then he goes, but that's a good thing. And then you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I hear you. You know, and so you're, you're on this little emotional roller co coaster to it, to a certain degree. Um, but anyway, so let's keep going. yeah, let's keep going. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. It's not as long this one, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, no. We're two pages from the end. <clears throat> pretty good all right now a change of direction is by its very nature okay so here we go with barfield right <laughs> a change of direction <laughs> a 
A change of direction is by its very nature, a change which must have taken place at a definite point in time. The moment of change may be easily observable, may be easy to determine or locate, or it may not. In the case of a billiard ball hitting the cushion and rebounding, it is easy enough. In the case of a more complex phenomenon, it may be very much harder. The waves, for instance, keep on coming, coming in even after the tide has turned. And an extra large wave may make us doubt whether it has turned yet at, after all. In the case of an infinitely more complex phenomenon, such as the evolution of human consciousness, <laughs> it is even less likely that the actual moment of change will be easily observable. And one of the things I'd like to point out was uh, one of the first things I learned about Barfield was that he called words fossils of consciousness. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I've always thought of him as kind of like a language archaeologist, <laughs> you know, he's kind of, he's going back in time and he's digging up all these words and he's going, oh, what does this indicate about how people perceived the world, perceived themselves, you know, and when, and he's, and he's looking for that date, right? He's trying to date these turning points in our consciousness and he uses language to do that. Okay. So, um, where was I? Mm. But that there was such a moment, even though we are unable to locate it exactly, is a conclusion to which reason itself compels us, for otherwise there could not have been a change of direction at all. Moreover, if the moment of change or reversal cannot be exactly pinpointed, that does not mean that it cannot be placed at all. I don't know the exact moment at which the incoming tide changed to an outflowing one. So, uh, and I, I think I want to stop here and talk about that, that description. Because didn't we talk about this at one point? <laughs> I think we did privately. Um, the in the incoming tide is when when the human being is using the material world, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's that? What's that quote from Bentham? Back here, hang on. Here. Um, every word that has a material import. There belongs also an immaterial one, and every word that has an immaterial import, there belongs, or at least did belong, a material one. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, um, because, well, I'm assuming, because he says at least did belong, that, that would be the earlier one, right? The, the word that has an immaterial Im import had a material one which is when you're looking around in the world and you're like, oh, uh, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like a tree. Mm -hmm. I'm stiff as a tree or something like that. Right. And you're speaking like poetically metaphor. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. But, and, and, and so he says here that this, this um, moment of change went from being an incoming tide to an outflowing tide. Right. So if you put yourself at the center of that, then the world is coming into you right? It's filling you up. And now it's flowing out of you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I think that's important for the next part here. Yeah. Um, what's going on in the uh, chat? I feel <laughs> like a teacher that wants to say stop passing notes. Oh, I literally, I saw that there was like 73 comments in the chat. And I was like, if I turn that on, I'm going to be Don't so do it. distracted. No, <laughs> so no. Like, yeah. Okay. I, All right. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody's actually in the chat's actually listening. Just give me a thumbs up because it sounds like they're having a separate conversation with someone yeah. else um 
Okay, so the outflowing one, but I do know that there, okay, let me read that sentence again. Moreover, if the moment or change or reversal cannot be exactly pinpointed, that does not mean that it cannot be placed at all. I don't know the exact moment at which the incoming tide changed to an outflowing one, but I do know that it is an outflowing one now, and that five minutes ago, let's say, it was still coming in. So there, uh, when he says that last sentence, I think what he's getting at is there was a moment, right? Five minutes ago, it was an incoming one. Now it's an outflowing one. So there's like, there's this like sharp moment in time where this changes. Yeah. Okay. Ra yeah. Rapidly, really rapidly. And now if I may leave my analogy of the turning of the tide and return to this change I have been speaking of, this reversal in the direction of man's relation to his environment, this change from a period in which, with the help of language, man is drawing his self-consciousness, as it were, out of the world around him, to a period in which he is, again, with the help of language, in a position to give back to nature something of the treasure he took once from her then a student of the history of the word meanings can certainly be as definite as this. He can say with confidence, okay, that the great change of uh, direction took place between, well, let's say between the death of Alexander the Great and the birth of St. Augustine. Okay, so somewhere in there, the, the tide went from inflowing to outflowing. Indeed, there are indications which would tempt him to be much more precise. <laughs> this is Barfield's dry humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Again, I'll only give one such indication. If one contrasts the meaning of the Greek word for word or reason or discourse, for it could mean all three, I'm referring to the word logos. If one contrasts the meaning of that word as it stood in the time of Plato and Aristotle, with its later meaning, or to put it another way, if one contrasts the meaning of the old word logos with the meaning of the words which we have to use to translate it, and if one then moves, <clears throat> moves the microscope a little nearer, so to speak, so as to determine, if possible, the moment, or at least the single century of transition from the old to the new, then one is struck immediately by the way in which this word logos was being used. In Alexandria, for instance, used by the Greeks and used also by the Jews in the first century BC, one may, one may even be a little more pedantically precise and remark that that particular word was in special, a special use in the Stoic philosophy and that it was in, in expounding the Stoic philosophy that the concepts objective and subjective first make their appearance in a clearly recognizable form. In other words, it was then that the fundamental duality with which we are now so familiar was first clearly formulated, was first sharply focused, a duality no longer merely between mind on one side and senses on the other, which had long been familiar to the Greeks, but a duality between a self on the one side and its environment on the other. And so if it were possible, and of course it is not, that a man should have pursued the kind of studies I have been speaking of without ever having read the Gospels or the epistles of St. Paul, without ever having heard of Christianity, he would nevertheless be impelled by his reason to the conclusion that a crucial moment in the evolution of humanity must have occurred certainly during the seven or eight centuries on either side of the reign of Augustus and probably somewhere near the middle of that period. <laughs> it's getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing getting warmer, getting colder, yeah. you know. You don't think he's being condescending when he's doing that? No, he's, you know, I, <laughs> he's teasing us, you know I, I, I never saw this at all reading um, Saving the Appearances, but having read these essays now and listened to his lecture, that, that live lecture yeah. where he's actually he's speaking, funny. he's really playful. Mm -hmm. He's really playful. 
Okay. Um, this he would feel from the whole course of his studies was the moment at which the flow of the spiritual tide into the individual self was exhausted and the possibility of an outward flow began. This was the moment at which there was consummated that age-long process of contraction of the immaterial qualities of the cosmos into a human center, into an inner world, which had made the possible, had made possible the development of an immaterial language. This, therefore, was the moment in which his true selfhood, his spiritual selfhood, entered into the body of man. Casting about for a word to denote that moment, what one would he be likely to choose? I think he would be almost obliged to choose the word incarnation. The entering into the body, the entering into the flesh. And now let us further suppose that our imaginary student of the history of language having had up to now that conspicuous gap in his general historical knowledge, was suddenly confronted for the first time with the Christian record. That he now learned for the first time that at about the middle of the period which his investigation had marked off, a man was born who claimed to be the Son of God and to have come down from heaven and that he spoke to his followers of the Father in me and I in you. Yeah. That he told all those who stood around him that, quote, the kingdom of God is within you, unquote, and startled them and strove to reverse the direction of their thought. And here's my favorite part. I got this all, all underlined. <laughs> For the word metanoia, which is translated repentance, also means a reversal of the direction of the mind. He startled them and strove to reverse the direction of their thought by assuring them that it is not that which cometh into a man which defiles him, but that which goeth out of him. Hmm. Lastly, so so this is this is now the, the student of philology discovering that, oh my God, I've marked off this point in time in history. Mm -hmm. And look at that. There's a guy saying this stuff. Yeah. Right. He's talking about it. Okay. So he's still in that mode of, 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 uh, of um, narration here. Lastly, let me further suppose that excited by what he's just heard, our student make further inquiries and learn that this man, so far from being a charlatan or a lunatic, had long been acknowledged, even by those who regarded his claim to have come down from heaven as a delusion, as the nearest anyone had ever come to being a perfect man. What conclusion do you think our student would be likely to draw? Well, I say, well, as I say, the supposition is an impossible one, but it is possible. I know, because it happened in my own case. For a man to have been brought up in the belief and to have taken it for granted that the account given in the Gospels of the birth and the resurrection of Christ is a noble fairy story with no more claim to historical accuracy than any other myth. And it is possible for such a man, after studying in depth the history of the growth of language, to look again at the New Testament and the literature and tradition that has grown up around it, and to accept, if you like, to be obliged to, to accept the record as, as a historical fact, not because of the authority of the church, nor by any process of ratiocination, such as C.S. Lewis has recorded in his own case, but rather because it fitted so inevitably with the other facts he had already found. Rather because he felt in the utmost humility, that he, if he had never thought of it through the scriptures, he would have been obliged to try to, his best to invent something like it as a hypothesis to save the appearances. That last line is just like yeah, incredible. 
if he had not heard of it through the scriptures, he would have been obliged to invent it as a hypothesis. That's amazing. Okay, that's the end of the essay. Um, and, yeah. Whew, yeah. So good. What'd you think, Lance? Yeah. <laughs> if you guys have kept up, you read it right <laughs> alongside with us. You're welcome to join and talk about it. Yeah. I don't know where to begin. I keep on going back to um, this idea of the, and I, I know I talked with you a little bit about it er earlier, but it's like this idea of the, the incarnation being the formation of the, of self-awareness, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I feel like that also, uh, the contraction of like time <laughs> to a single moment. Um, I don't know. It's just, I'm thinking way too out here. <laughs> well, you know, like I just, I just love the, I love the, the, um, what do you call that? The, the thing he says about the incoming tide and the outflowing one, right? So this is his, and he says it happened, let's say five minutes ago. So it was a, like, there was this sharp moment in time when consciousness had had, it was like filled up with the inflowing tide. Mm -hmm. And now that inflowing tide flowed out. And then he uses the, he uses the uh, um, description of, um, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out, right? Yeah. And um, and it's it's because of that sharp line that's that he sees. He doesn't yet know where, but he seems to be able to identify it through the use of the word logos, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, so he locates it in around Stoic philosophy. Mm -hmm. right and then he narrows it down to somewhere around the time of augustus probably somewhere in the middle <laughs> and then he opens his bible and goes what yeah <laughs> wait a minute there it is yeah. and then he ends the essay with well if i hadn't have found it i would have made it up as a hypothesis mm -hmm. i would have written this down as a like and I think he was dead serious about that. I think he was dead serious about that. If he hadn't have discovered it in the scriptures, he would have made that hypothesis. Yeah. At that, you know, he would have pointed at that time period yeah. as, the pla as the place where there was a metanoia. Well, I won't even use air quotes. Metanoia, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So he's... And, and he's He's actually giving a historic argument to a certain to he's to a giving a philological point. argument for for the effect that Christ had on human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. The effect of his life and his teaching and his well, his whole everything, right? All we of can it. do this by the study of language if we're willing to take it through human right. history. That, that's why Even I said you know, earlier yeah. he, you know he uses the term words uh, he calls words fossils of consciousness and so he's like an archaeologist and he's looking for yeah proof but he's doing it in in um in terms of language right that's where that's where he's looking he's looking in into language to um locate these things and um and I don't know, I just I just find it really, really fascinating because 
because you, you can do that. Like you can, you can do that if you have enough information to do it with, you know? And I remember, you know, his first, what is it, his first larger book? That was honestly the first time I ever read Barfield was like a few, a few um, highlighted chapters and, and sections from uh, history and English words, you know. Yeah, I have that one. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. And, and Poetic Diction. Yeah. Poetic um, too. Yeah. Yeah. But it was it was where, you know, Barfield tiptoes around that. It's like he's he's approaching what I feel like is a subject that we've approached a lot on on Grail Country is like this, this validity of a, a perhaps. Um, or at least we see it as as a valid way of knowing at least when we go back in time that was rooted in this immaterial language that uh, in any showing it going through this, like this evolution that now I, I guess at the end of the essay, I'm still trying to figure out, I'm left trying to figure out whether or not Barfield still sees um, like, he's not qualifying this as a good thing or a bad thing that this, this event occurred it's just this is this is this can't be right this is what occurred and this is it this is it and and you know that okay so this is and know. i had i had to i had to wrestle with this myself like i found, <laughs> my, I found myself saying okay what what is it that wants to do that call it good or bad like why yeah. am i why am i doing this right mm-hmm I like I don't have an answer. I I just know that I had to wrestle with those feelings and I had to ask myself you know when someone says something like yeah that's that you know when when Barfield says something like yep yeah, you know original participation gone overdone mm -hmm. and we can't go back I'm I get like I I'm like a little kid I want to stamp my feet and get mad. Oh yeah I'm still yeah I'm like that. <laughs> I actually do. Actually, sometimes when I get mad, I stamp my foot still. <laughs> That's when I'm really mad. Or it's more like frustrated. So I guess the challenge is, is I've got to, I've got to work through that. That's a, <laughs> because it, it, there seriously is this, this way in which I, uh, if, if final participation, um, it, still includes this kind of uh and and this is where i probably misunderstand barfield includes the a, a kind of necessary like differentiation that occurs in in a okay now how do i say this well let's just put it in really layman's terms it includes a withdrawal mm-hmm and and this is the, the thing. The withdrawal we, never leaves you. The withdrawal we, is always with you. Your experience of that withdrawal actually forever haunts you and is always going to be a part of you. And so you have to learn how to live with that withdrawal in, yeah, it, in order to even experience what final participation is. Like you have to well let, really let, have to integrate like I, the withdrawal. Okay. Yes. Yes, but but it's like entering the dark woods in the fairy tale, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's 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 the um it's the dark woods in the fairy tale. Let's just keep it simple. And and um, when you come out um, of the dark woods in a fairy tale, you're usually a better person, right? Yeah. Or you or you don't come out actually. <laughs> you get eaten by the by the <laughs> yeah. witch or whatever, you know. Um, so when you come out, you're a better person, right? And, and the dark woods recede into your, into the background. Like mm -hmm. you're not carrying the dark woods on your back. You know what I mean? You don't have to, you don't have to keep the dark woods with you. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it also, and it also, um, 
Like you learned probably a, a lot of really important skills in those dark woods. Well, yeah, that's why I say when yeah. you come out of the dark woods, you're you're some kind of a hero, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is what the uh, descent into Hades is 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 also about. Okay, it's because and I, and th this is something that I, I started thinking about after listening to Douglas Harding, um, and I have actually um, decided that I'm going to start from the beginning and re listen to the whole thing now because I only listened to the last 10 hours or something. And um, But he talks about in there, he talks about the descent and the ascent, right? And it's a thing that we do within ourselves. We descend down in and we ascend to the heavens, right? Yeah. But and does so, he also see that as an evol evolution of consciousness that takes place over the lifetime? Mm -hmm. Like he sees that. Yeah, like I, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, um, a lot of um, correlation to Harding's thought here now, like yeah. Harding to Barfield, Barfield to Harding. You know, yeah. and it's interesting because they both started writing. Like, as far as I remember, Douglas Harding started writing his book, his like his tome, in 1939. Okay, yeah, it took him like. 10 years or something to write the thing My and they got published in 52. Right. And um, so anyway, it's, it's, um, I don't know how much they, I mean, I, he was obviously aware of CS Lewis Harding was, he could have been listening to Owen Barfield too. He could have been going to Owen Barfield's lectures for all I know, like, but they were all, they yeah. were all somehow swimming in that water. Right. Yeah. Just like, yeah. 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 Super interesting. And everybody's so, talking about the same, the, the same events. And, 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 and Douglas Harding puts it in, in, in terms of the child, the toddler, the teenager and the sage. Yeah. And I remember when I first saw that video from Harding, I thought that's exactly what Barfield's talking about. His final participation. Could we map that on to the sage to a certain yeah. In the yes. sense that, like that yeah. is, that is totally who has gone through the withdrawal and and now has found a way to, you know, integrate well, what, experience and. Well, what the what what Harding says about the sage is the sage carries the child through, okay? Yeah, yeah. and so, preserves the child. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, because you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become a little <laughs> child. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like we, this, we had this conversation before. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll keep having it because it's amazing. Yeah. Like it's it's so amazing, right? Yeah. And um and like for for Harding, the only place that you don't want to be is the teenager, because he says, when you look in the mirror, you think that that's who you are. Okay. And that's exactly what happens in withdrawal. Yeah. Where you think that that's like, you're in this self. What, what did you call that? Referential, mm -hmm. right? Mode of being this Ouroboros, right? And that's all, that's just all about me. And, you know, Malcolm Geit, who's also a very, um, you know, a CS Lewis and Owen Barfield scholar and George McDonald scholar and so on. And a poet. And a priest, um, you know, he, he, he in one of his lectures, he talked about how the poetry today, it's like the poets are in a room that is lined with mirrors. Sure. And when he said that, I was like, that's exactly what Douglas Harding's talking about when he talks about the teenager. Right. And he's and Douglas Harding says, no wonder the teenager is angry. Yeah. Because their whole world has been taken away from them. Right. Because be be before that, they were everything. Exactly. They were the beach. They were the, the ocean. They were the fish. They were the dog. They were the bird. They were the they were the pepper in your garden. <laughs> Standing there innocently holding this ghost pepper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they had they had knowledge from within, too. You know, that 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 very idea of. Uh, the child being 
participating in the nature of the horse by by pretending to be to be the horse itself and mm -hmm. the difference between like that that's i'm thinking again about what it is like to be a dad and good raising kids and um how that's a almost like i don't know how what other opportunity i would have in life besides fatherhood to and i hesitate to say this because i know there's a lot of people that you know aren't capable of, of becoming fathers or 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 don't want to be fathers or whatever you know but um i see it as one of the only way opportunities that i have in my life to like even begin the process of uh learning what it would be to 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 become like a child or to like re re and re integrate child and integrate re -integrate. Re integrate the withdrawal that i had felt in my teen years right right mm -hmm. like i i'm still <laughs> call me a victim or whatever, but I'm so traumatized by it, you know, You're processing, and, processing, yeah, processing it. And so it's mm -hmm. like, that's, uh, it's very much like, like I see my experience with my own son and it's like, it's, it's amazing when I can actually get out of that world of the immaterial language out of that self-referential world in, in, and actually be almost in his world where I am experiencing myself in, in the material world. And there's no distinction between me and that material right. world. I'm in, in my imagination begins to run wild. Like there's, there's all these scales that begin. It's almost like all these scales begin to yeah. fall my eyes at times totally. because I'm, I, and it's what a blessing it is. This is why children are such gifts is because yeah. like they, they present us with this opportunity that like, I don't know if I would have had, I would have it any other way. Like, you know, my sister always says, you know, cause she's got kids, I've got kids and now our kids are having kids. Right. And, and she always says to me, Sherry, you know, you know, that the children will teach them. Mm. Right? Wow. Yeah. They will teach them. And you have to let that happen. Like that, that's the that's the thing. You know? Um it's it because, you know, as 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 a parent or as somebody with experience, you know, you want to interfere or tell or you know, but people need to they need to come. I think it was Miguel Chris said something like this recently. He said, as a therapist, I don't tell people how to live. I help them to see how to live. I help them to, you know, I help and, and them literally, actually see it for themselves. It's find, like, find the answer. And, and I, this isn't necessarily, I don't say this to be depressing, but like my son will notice things and point things out to me that my attention and awareness is not, on and oftentimes they're the most beautiful things that i'm like not taking the time to see and he's pointing to clouds and birds and trees and in the moon and he's seeing things i'm not even even if it's a, a an airplane up in the sky i'm just like so busy i don't even take i you know i don't even take the time to even notice like half the things that he just knows. Yeah. And well, you know, the old you know, saying, nose to the grindstone, right? Yeah, nose to the grindstone. Saying? You know, like I had a, I had a, a parrot um, and he was a macaw and I got him and then we started renovating this house. And so we lived in a wall tent next to the construction site for, yeah. you know, the whole year. Wow. And, and so my parrot, he used to just hang out outside. Like, you know, he was, he'd be on his stand or whatever. There was a, actually one of the trees in our yard had fallen and it was snagged in another tree and he would just walk up and down there and talk. But he was constantly 
because they have eyes on the sides of their heads, right? Mm -hmm. And so he could, he would, all of a sudden I'd see him going like this and he'd make this little growling noise, right? And I'd look up and there'd be this huge flock of sandhill cranes or trumpeter mm -hmm. swans or there'd be an eagle flying by. And, you know, and I thought to myself, man, if it wasn't for Coco, I wouldn't even notice any of that stuff. But he was constantly going, you know, making a noise. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And, and he just, it just really made me appreciate what he was doing for me, right? Mm -hmm. Showing me all these things. Yeah. And that's what you're saying about your son, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, your, your head's down and you're just doing your thing and you're working hard and providing for him. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and he's your little angel. He's like, Hey daddy, look, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. So yeah. There's a reason cherubs are, you know, <laughs> Little chubby, chubby babies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> but right. wasn't that a wild ride with Owen Barfield, you know, on a little uh, archaeological um, journey of language mm -hmm. to arrive at precisely the moment in time when Christ was to reveal a complete change in the evolution of human consciousness? Yes. Like that's essentially what we just read. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I think that's I think that's fantastic. Yes. I, just love it. I completely agree. And yeah. I it just it, like even what is the end of the Novalis quote again? You mentioned it earlier mm -hmm. on when we were talking. Is Novalis? it I mentioned Novalis's quote? Or maybe you didn't. No, maybe it was the George McDonald quote. About the human being turned inside out? Yeah, the human being turned inside out or everything everything that man sees is... Oh. Yeah, oh, I know what that... I can read it. It's... Um... The no... Yeah. I swear it's... Oh, are you talking about... Do you want me to read the Novalis quote? Maybe I should. Sometimes yeah, if, the... you, if you can. I mean, I don't know if I you have find that. It. I got it. I got it handy. <laughs> I'm handy with this stuff. Okay. What should I read in German or in English? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, German would be nice. And this is uh, translated by Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. Mm -hmm. It is possible to think of stories without context, but with association, like dreams. Poems are that are merely melodious and full of beautiful words, but also without any meaning or context at most individual stands as understandable are like fragments of the most diverse things. This true poetry can at most have an allegorical meaning on a large scale and an indirect effect like music. That is why nature is as purely poetical as the chamber of a, of a magician, a physicist's study, a nursery, a storeroom, a fairy tale is like an image from a dream without context. An ensemble of wonderful things and occurrences. Example, a musical fantasy, the harmonic effects of an Aeolian harp, nature itself. In a real fairy tale, everything must be wonderful, mysterious, and coherent. Everything must be animated, each thing in a different way. The whole of nature must be whimsically mixed with the whole world of spirits. Here enters the time of anarchy, lawlessness, freedom, the natural state of nature, the time of the world. The world of the fairy tale is quite opposite to the world of truth. And here's the real tricky last part of this. And for that very reason is as similar to it as chaos is. To perfect creation. I love that. Mm. <laughs> talk about a talk about a, a wild turn. Do you know that wasn't even the Naval's quote that I was I was actually no. you know? <laughs> as I was reading it, I'm like, what is it in here that he was <laughs> I was well, yeah, I was, but it's a great quote. Also, I was thinking of the one at the beginning of Fantasties. 
Is that not a Novalis quote? That's it. This is the one from the beginning of Fantasties. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it sounds more familiar to you in German. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my two my two semesters in German in college. <laughs> can barely form a sentence. Well, what was it you were thinking of? Like when you wanted me to well, read it, I, I was, it was again, this idea of, um, like seeing, seeing my own reflection in, mm -hmm. in nature or seeing myself in nature. Mm -hmm. I, I at one point had a conversation with you and I described to you how that made me feel uncomfortable as if I was somehow, um, as if I was somehow projecting myself onto the nature or something like that uh, versus um, having, having the nature inform me um, of, of, of who I am. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is I'm trying to think of what is that inside of myself uh, that, that it, doesn't want to see myself in, in nature because sometimes I see nature as so beautiful. So beyond me. Oh, you're still a piece of shit, Luke. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so. Sorry for the language. <laughs> no, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at is there's this. Let's just there's just this cut the like, yeah. I have to overcome that like kind of, that to pretend like that's not so something that I, I struggle with all the time is, you know, mm. uh, I think that's, that's, that's more so like something that you just, I, I just have to confess, you know? And so it's like, there's a way in which that always is a, is this, that's part of the scales falling off the eyes process when I do actually. Well, yeah. And you know, essentially what you're, what you're saying is that you have to come to love yourself mm -hmm. because the reason that you don't see yourself as nature is because you love nature mm -hmm. and you don't, you don't want to your part. Yeah. You don't you don't want to love yourself in the same way, right? You don't think that you're deserving of that. Yeah. And you know, like this is the thing that I've said many times um in order to really understand God, I think, and the spiritual journey, you have to you have to come to love yourself the way it, but you have to come to love your see yourself the way God sees you. Mm -hmm. Right? Which involves As compassion. Child. Compassion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the understanding of, of, you know, God as as father as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and truly understanding who you are as son. Yeah. And, totally. and not son three times removed or, or son who, you know, like it, it, it really is like understanding that you actually belong in the family, you know? Um, and I think that that, yeah, that's a, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. It is a real thing. And I had to learn it the hard way. Yeah. Like I was ready to do serious damage to myself because of it. Yeah. You know, and and as stupid as this sounds, it hadn't, you know, if it hadn't been for a nurse who said to me, would you do that to someone who, a friend of yours who was in the same position you're in right now? Would you say that to them? I'm like, of course not. But I, you know, it's perfectly fine for me to say that to myself. Mm -hmm. She's like, uh, no. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, you know, and way late, the light went on. Right. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And then emerges that process of transformation that, you know, I, yeah. And I think really for me, it's, it's depending on the day or the, or, or the season I'm in or, or what, whatever, you know, 
Oh, well, yeah. I mean, we're always going to come down hard on ourselves. Uh, we are our worst critics, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, um, I don't know. Somehow that's a kind of self self centeredness too. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, um, I have to be able to lean back and, and let, and, you know, into, into, into my father's arms mm -hmm. and know that he's got me like really know that. And, mm -hmm. um, and any kind of frustration with myself is usually because I've, I'm losing control, control of something. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, <laughs> right pretty much yeah, yeah. my temper yeah. or my finances or mm -hmm. whatever you know yeah and, um, and then yeah. you you know then then you got to do the free fall thing right then mm -hmm. you're free falling yeah yeah and that's tough that's hard so anyway yeah. um i forget how i was gonna tie that all back in because that was that wasn't even the direction I was originally thinking I'd go. I'm really riding my intuition, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, I think I think it's right. Like I think because you're because Barfield's talking about deriving language from nature. Yeah. Right. And and having this in incoming tide, mm -hmm. and then this outgoing tide. Right. Yeah. And um, you know, I I kind of I really love that in in the essay because to me then it feels more like uh, a gift, right? Of um, it's like we were filled up because doesn't he say something in there about like you know once once this incoming tide of nature has been exhausted, he says that. Um, then the outflowing tide begins, right? Yeah. And and so I suppose he sees language ha having exhausted it, right? Like there's no more language to be derived from nature. You know, we've kind of just covered it all. And now the outflowing begins. And, you know, I can relate to that in, in a very real way because <laughs> I spent like, and I've told you, talked to you about this, I spent like 23 years just in flowing tide mm -hmm. and no outflowing thing happening. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, I really got the sense, like when I became part of this community that I had to do, I had to do the outflowing thing. Like God yeah. said, I want you to learn how to say now. It was really important. And mm -hmm. I, and I've said this before, I don't know why. Like, I'm not saying that I have something important to say to everyone. Here I am, you know, with my sign, the end is near, you know. <laughs> it's not it. it. This is, for some reason, it's important for me mm -hmm. to let this come out, right? This Because it was just like 23 years of, you know. Yeah. And now it's the outflowing thing. And, yeah. um and I really feel that, like on a on a personal level, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, and I. Yeah, it just makes me. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about my son again because it's it. I just I think about that journey, and I think like there's oftentimes, um, uh, where you might not see where you're at in in your own your own story too. Cause you're holding on to um, like the work is happening to you. Mm -hmm. uh, this process of transformation, this evolution of consciousness that you're going through, perhaps the U shaped journey um, in, in to pretend like you're in, in control of that timeline, you know, uh, or how that evolves exactly. Like I'm seeing this process happen with my, with my son and I I'm so slow to catch on like and I'm not trying to berate myself as a parent but I'm like I'm so too. slow to 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 realize what's happening and the gift that is my son like I talked about mm -hmm. earlier you know and now 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 my daughter too and yeah. that, that that I'm seeing God moving in my life right but 
um, and, and my eyes are open to that. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, uh, it just, it's not this expedited process of, um, you know, what are the, what is the book? <laughs> Two steps forward, three steps back. Or like, uh, I've almost hindsight, like almost all my revelations are all hindsight revelations in which I, I wish I, you know, like you don't, I'm always yeah. telling myself, uh, short by not, I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but they're all, they're all ways in which I'm constantly seeing ways in which I could be better. And sometimes yeah. that's daunting versus the realization that you are where you should be, you know, like we've talked about in other previous, yeah. Yeah. previous uh, live streams and stuff, you know, so it's like, there's the way in which that, um, and trusting the process, you know, trusting like that, uh, you know, those scales are, are continuing to, to fall off your eyes and that like, I'm going to be going through this journey for like, I've got these children who I continue, I can continue to choose to see as like this amazing gift and mm -hmm. opportunity in my life to, to be able to I, not become a sage, but to relearn how to uh, or get uh, or, or well the thing is like like um douglas harding says in that clip he says you know you most people stay in the teenager phase okay yeah. because it's it's like super easy to be angry i would even say having seen some of the comments here because i let them run and I don't know. What's going I, on you know, there. having seen some of the comments, I would actually say that the, there is a particular someone in the in the comment section who's you know pretty angry teenager, <laughs> my opinion. But um, I'm not about, about about the sage. The sage. The sage is is well. You have to let go of all that anger and bitterness, right? You have to let go of your victimhood, you know, oh, of, know. The why, of the why me. And, and, um, and I think once that happens, I don't, you know, like, when, and where I don't do think, you... I don't think we're supposed to become sages. Like, I don't yeah. think that, you know, it, it's not like, oh, okay, well, I, oh, I missed the bus, you know, I'll never make it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I believe that there is life after death, right? Which means that this journey just continues. And, and, um, and I think that, that, you know, ultimately, um, yeah. ultimately that's, that's what's going to happen is we will enter the kingdom and we will be those little children. Yeah. Right. So, um, but anyway, I, I, um, I just, I just remember how Harding said that he said, you know, most people, will just remain there. Yeah. They'll just stay there. And I've talked to you about this. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, Jesus said to often, he said often to people, do you want to be healed? Oh, yeah. Because I met, especially on a lot of my, um, you know, psychological journeys, <laughs> my mental illness, let's just call it. I met a lot of people who didn't want to be healed. I think that I struggle with that, like in, in very real ways. And I know that like, um, because it, it, it where I remember seeing people even referring to their own depression as like, if you could, if you could image your depression as being like, uh, just this fuzzy cloud that is with you all the time. If, if you make it your friend, which is way different than Rilke saying you need to live everything or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's almost like this way in which you've welcomed it in as mm -hmm. a permanent specter in, in, in vantage point that you're going to view your entire reality through. And, and I think I've done, I've done that and ha slip back into that all the time where, um, you know, you're slipping back into this, like you know, version of yourself from 
10 years ago or, or your five-year-old version of yourself or whatever, which that sounds actually like a good thing, the five-year-old version. But <laughs> like, you know, like I, I actually don't want to go back to my childhood. I'm at that point, like when I was your age, I was like, oh man, I wish I was a kid again and I didn't have to worry about anything and I didn't have to go to work and I didn't have to set my alarm and I didn't have to worry about what the neighbors thought and I didn't have to, you know? Oh, I think about that all the time. I think about wanting to be a cat sometimes when I see my cat walking around the backyard. <laughs> but 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 now I'm like, and I've, it's funny because I've talked to a few women my age, and they're they're the same. They're like, no way. <laughs> like we're we're safely on the other shore now. What do we want to go back over there for? <laughs> yeah, no, I we're just like, woo, made it. You know. <laughs> Yeah. And um, not that we've arrived or anything like that, but we've we've come well, a distance and we just don't want to go back. You know, do you think do you think time shapes? Uh, and I actually don't think let me just say this really quick. I actually don't think that knowing what I know now at the age of 35 would have been helpful because I needed like I wouldn't know what I know now if I hadn't done the stupid shit that I did when I was 35. Right. OK. Well, yeah, and the, and now you can look back and you can like I I wonder if, like if age shapes the contours of our gratitude to a certain degree because like there's oh yeah all... because you took you mentioned this it, it's about retrospect yeah yeah right? exactly and so like a lot of the times like like I and this is what what's problematic to me um. <laughs> Lance is not Lance, Lance isn't going like, back. Yeah, back. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> uh, yeah. We should have the never going back club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think exactly what I what I was gonna say there, but sorry. No, no. Um I don't know. I'm losing it, but I don't know. It, it's not even. It's not even necessarily this. This desire to go. Well, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I don't know. I lost the thought. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I'm just reading the the quote from page 193 by Owen Barfield on the front of the book. Words are only themselves by being more than themselves. Perhaps the same thing is true of human beings, mm -hmm. right? And, um, yeah, it's a long, you know, like this is what I said to uh, a young woman. Um, she writes a sub stack now, but she used to, she used to come here uh, and stay in the summer times and, um, just on this long, 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 <laughs> like excruciatingly long journey of trying to figure out who she is. Mm -hmm. She's still in the middle of it. And I said to her, I said, look, we have a whole life to live. <laughs> and that's why we need it. Okay. Oh my gosh. I agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where we learn it actually. And the thing is, is I, I, I think I just see that my life has been marked by intense gratitude, like seasons of intense gratitude. And, 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 um, then I've also seen my, myself fluctuating though, where I, you know, I do become bitter and I do become, you know, resentful and, mm -hmm. and I withdraw, you know, and I, yeah. I go dark for a while, you know, and, and that's, that's not, you know, there's, there's a way in which that fluctuation, um, that fluctuation could be, you don't, you don't want to imagine that it's just this, you know, age, age is going to continue to morph that experience into just simply experiencing gratitude, but also that you are integrating that, that kind of, um, 
those seasons into some kind of equilibrium or harmony or where you see the both sides of that coin and you are so grateful even for like you suggested some of the some of the um i don't know some of the crazy stuff that may have occurred in life and mm -hmm. you then you're then able to uh, say, I'm so thankful for this because I would be no, no other person besides, you know, who I, who I've, who I've made, who I've become today. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time articulating myself, but I apologize. Well, maybe it's all those fumes in the. <laughs> it is. I've been around oil primer all day long. I had a mask on, but at some point those, those carbon filters that are on, on those masks, they don't, they don't work with oil. There's really no good, uh, you Except know, unless you want just like fresh air, but then you don't want any, anything. Yeah, to but land then, on. So oftentimes you won't even feel it until you go up and get fresh air. And then all of a sudden it hits you and you're oh. on the ground. I've had that happen with oil wow. prime basements and stuff like that. It's like, and, and you, yeah, it's not, I've, I've, spent way too much of my life around volatile chemicals, but um, it's kind of part of my job too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. When know. we, when we rent, when we re, re, redid our house, I mean, the house was a log house mm -hmm. and then we put an addition on the front of it. So the walls were all log, you know, and then we did a timber frame addition but we reframed the whole floor plan. Like the whole house is a totally different house, right? Than the one we moved into. And, and so like, and we had to tear out the, um, like we had to, it, it's a, it's a, what do you call those um, ground level entry basement? You know, like we don't have like a, a basement basement. It's like ground level entry. And then there's an upper floor. And anyway, um, we had to take the floor out and all the fr all the framing for all the rooms down there. Like it was just a big open space, and then we took out all the concrete because we had we had a creek flowing under our house, wow. just flowing, eh? And and then unfortunately, we ended up having to have like a um, what do you call those geo engineer or whatever mm -hmm. come in and and because they couldn't they couldn't put the addition in because the ground was too soft because of all the water. Yeah. Oh, anyway, that sounds that, insane. You basically probably had to like rebuild your foundation at that point. We didn't do had to do the foundation, but we had to put in um, drainage all around the house mm -hmm. to drain the water away from it. And gotcha. then we had to leave. We we left the basement open with this creek running through it until the water stopped running to mm -hmm. see if it worked. And then we had to let it dry out so that they could put the addition on in. Yeah. Right. But anyway, and then and then when we redid everything, um, we reframed the whole thing. Long story short, I said, I don't want any chemicals in my house. None. Mm -hmm. So, and paint was a huge deal for me. I was just like, no paint. I don't want any yeah. paint. And um, so we got, we got, um, it's actually an American company called American Clay. And um, and just look it up, Luke. It's it's fantastic. It was a little bit expensive, but as you would imagine, if it's like an alternative, you know, wall. It's, it's actual clay. Covering. It's all it's and it's colored with minerals, and um, it actually exudes negative ions into your house, which is really good oh my for God. you. And uh, that's what my whole house is. My whole house is done with American clay. And one wall in, in the guest bedroom is painted. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because we ran out of clay and my husband was like, oh, I just want to get it done. So he painted yeah. it and I was like, ah, oh, frick. Didn't want yeah. that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the whole house is stone, wood, and clay. Yeah. That's it. So I do, I do, uh, I've done lead mitigation for like the last, um, oh gosh maybe seven years, 
So like scraping lead houses, painting lead houses and stuff like oh, that. Oh gosh, Luke. Oh yeah. And, and so you have to go through all these PPE, PPE yeah. um, courses. Yeah. You got to go through courses. You got to get certified. So um, I, uh, anyways, all that to say is it's, it's like one of those things where you have to wonder like, <laughs> at what point does, does, does this stuff affect you? You know, but like, I, I'm like one of those people too, that I just, like, you know, didn't really know or whatever at the time when, when all these things were going, how serious some of that stuff is. And, yeah. and then you get into it and then you're like, oh, well, I can't really stop doing this. And the more that I read into this, the more I've just become fearful and think I'm dying <laughs> because I've got lead poisoning or something like that. And it's well, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think you can get rid of it. No, like you, oh, can, yeah, get, you can go you can get it out of your body and all that yeah. stuff. So you're okay. Yeah. I'm not worried. You, there's a, there's more lead in the water than there is. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I've learned how to treat and seal, um, lead based paint and, and stuff like that. Uh, so it's like, I know, I know how to, um, eliminate its negative effects versus, uh, I don't know the, you can't really do anything when it's in your water, you know? So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Filter it. yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the water. That's why, yeah. Never mind. Well, you know, the main reason why I, I didn't want any synthetics in my house was because when I was a kid, there was a couple that were close friends with my parents, and they had a 16-year-old um, Down syndrome son, and they were an older cu couple, and um, their house caught on fire, and their son was massive. Like, he was a big guy, eh? He was a really big guy and um, strong and um, the house caught on fire and they, and they were, they, mom and dad ran out. They tried to get him to come. He wouldn't come. They ran out. She ran back in to get him out. He, he was too scared and he wouldn't come out. And, and the father's, you know, outside of the house and nobody's coming out. And so he goes in and his wife is laying laying on the living room floor and the carpet is melted because it's synthetic and he picks her up and it's all stuck to her, her back. It's like, mm -hmm. right. That's like bubbling on the floor yeah. and she's laying in it. Uh, yeah. And she died in hospital. Their son died in the fire. And, and, uh, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the reasons for their deaths was toxicity and synthetic fibers. And I'm just like, why are we doing this? And and then I hear from a friend whose husband is a firefighter that they're basically walking around in hazmat suits because there's so much toxicity in the smoke of these new houses. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. and we can't use plastic bags in the grocery store. <laughs> I know. That's the crazy part. I am. Um... Did you listen to that Jordan Peterson yes. podcast where he had some doctor on talking about house sickness or something like that? Mm -hmm. Where even the materials that are used in new construction have uh, just as harmful effects as like what, what it would be to live in, in a house from the 40s or the 1800s. And, and so this, uh, you know, a lot of times people believe that owning a newer home too is, as you know, they, they avoid any of the, the toxic construct and sure, maybe arguably it's much better because you could be living in a house with arsenic or, or some sort of yeah. snake poison on the walls or whatever and inhaling that sort of thing. But um, like my house, there's a lot to probably suspect there, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but all that to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It was just interesting because, it, but I, when I read that sort of stuff or hear that sort of stuff, I'm just like, it's another thing to fear. And I do think that like we can live in that fear of, you know, all these, all these life threatening things like 
Like, I don't want to not take microplastics seriously, but no. at some point, if I believe that my body cannot synthesize these plastics or something like that, or, or that there is no solution, like you can just doomsday your whole life around microplastics and you yeah. can spend, you could spend an afternoon doing that, which I think is reasonable. You can spend a couple of weeks doing that, which I think is reasonable. I did it with EMF radiation for, I don't know how long. Or like I could even take some steps to like paint my house with clay and that might be a really cool thing. And I'm, I'm going to take you up. It's on. It's actually it. really beautiful. Yeah. And, and it doesn't make your room sound echoey. Like it absorbs the sound. It's probably natural ochres too that it's dyed with. I would imagine that it's, oh, yeah. you said minerals. Yeah. So it's well, probably... see the, see that wall, that green. Right there? Mm -hmm. And then there's gold and yeah. Stuff like that. So my wife, you know, she's a natural dyer. And she started buying rocks like on online. These rocks just start showing up in the mail. I'm like, what the heck? Why are we buying rocks? <laughs> what? <laughs> Some so women just love to have rocks, you know? Like uh, mostly uh, mostly they're diamonds, but your wife actually wants rocks. <laughs> no, and what in it because they're like larger rocks. And and I'm like, what are these? And and she's like, they're ochres. And mm. so they're they're all these like natural mineral deposits that are of a specific that's color. that's how they color the clay. Just so go it's like a lake just pigment. Google, yeah, just Google uh American clay, Luke. And okay. um, I found a guy five hours from me who dealt in it and um, went down there to look at it and get an idea and then um, decided for it. And uh, he gave me a really good deal. And then I had this fabulous guy that I hired to mud all the drywall because we, dr we have drywall in the house. And um, and he was just incredibly good and really, really, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, what's the word? Hardworking, you know, mm. really hardworking and fast. <laughs> and we've mudded a lot, me and my husband. So we're like, oh, man, this guy's awesome. You know, it was like a, he was like the the <laughs> the. Um, What's the famous sculptor? Oh gosh. Leonardo da Vinci of drywall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what He's I mean? Open his path. <laughs> and um and and so I said to him, Hey, would you be interested in making some extra cash? Because have I got a project for you? <laughs> Anyways, I I got him into it and and the guy that sold me the clay came up and did a full afternoon of teaching him how to put it on mm. for free and then and and here's the deal though so and this young guy and he had a family and he was you know you know drywall is pretty hard work and it's not doesn't pay a lot right <coughs> well he ended up opening his own business and doing this wow. doing this um american clay that's and, and being and yeah and i i don't know how i got in touch with him somehow online somewhere i don't even remember where and i was just like oh no i met him in town and he wasn't from here he was from Kamloops. but I, anyway i'm just like that's wild you go sherry if it wasn't for you i wouldn't be where i am today that's what he said to me and i was like really that's amazing so that was really cool Mm -hmm. Leonardo to drywall. What's that? Leonardo to drywall. Oh, is so funny. <laughs> anyway, I think we should wrap it up. We're going yeah. all over the place, and I know, and yeah, like I apologize. so far from the essay. They're they're um, gonna make oil paint illegal in three years, and so I won't even be able to buy it anymore. So. Just find a place where you can get some chelation done and then get it out of your system and every now and then. Maybe that's a good idea. It is a good idea. <laughs> I always I have nothing but good ideas. <laughs> All right, I'll have to ask you what chelation is later. <laughs>
Okay. I'll let, let everybody go. Thank you so much for putting up with the last half hour of this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks guys. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.